Uh, very nice to meet you. Thank you for joining. Thank you very much. I know that I'm Mike. I'm my mic. Testing. Yes. We'd like to start the uh, Africa panel, please. We don't have a lot of time. Um, so if I could ask the panelists to join me here in the front. Um, and I would encourage those of you who are going to stay to listen to uh, move up to the front, including the comfy chairs up here. I think it'll be a better discussion if you're a bit closer. Otherwise, it feels very formal. Thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> Got to know how to turn this off. <laughs> That's okay. So I think we're lacking uh, one one panelist from Niger. English. Oh, is this is this English? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, we are missing, please, um, the Honorable Alma or, Ma or Maru for our panel, the representative from Niger. Shall we start? Okay. I think we can start, and um, uh, perhaps Mr. Amaro can join us in a few minutes. So if you all want to take a seat. Um, so my name is Lisa Kessner. I am uh, the practice manager uh, working on, on private sector development for IFC in Eastern and Southern Africa, um, including uh, in several countries where we work on the doing business uh, report uh, and, and uh, support governments on reforms, both in broad investment climate topics like doing business, uh, but also in some uh, sector-specific areas, uh, in particular, uh, for example, agribusiness and tourism, which we uh, partner with, with Rwanda on, for example. Um, so we don't have a lot of time. We have about 40 minutes till lunch. Um, so I think this is just a, a chance to dive a little bit deeper, building on the panel which my colleague Dalia just led, but to dive a bit deeper into, into the experience in Africa. Um, I'm very pleased to, to be joined here on the, the furthest left by the Honorable Emmanuel Hategeka, who is currently the ambassador of Rwanda to UAE, but I think very relevant for our uh, topic here today, uh, was formerly with the Rwandan uh, Development Board, who is the main uh, reform champion and, and leader on doing business in Rwanda, and we all know that, that Rwanda is a huge uh, success story in this. Um, I'm also very pleased to be joined by the Honorable Senator Mankoba Humalo, um, who is the Minister of Commerce of Minister of Commerce of Indi Commerce Industry and Trade, excuse me, of the Kingdom of Eswatini. Um, also, a country that has uh, focused quite quite a bit in recent years on the doing business reforms, and very pleased that um, he's traveled all this way to to share his experience. Uh, so I think what we'll do is first hear from each of them uh, why, why doing business. So following a little bit on the, the, one of the last questions Dahlia asked her panel. So we'll start with why doing business, why is it important for each of their countries. But then I think we'll try to dive a little bit deeper into how, how did they do it. Okay, so we'll start with the why and then, and then move to the how. So um, if, if I could ask uh, Mr. Hategeka maybe to start, I think everybody's very interested in the Rwanda experience. So why was it so important for Rwanda? And, and then we move uh, after that maybe to a bit of the how. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa, and uh, a very good afternoon to all of you. I guess it's uh, that moment when we are the only ones between you and your lunch. So I hope we can keep you entertained. Um, just a few minutes ago, I was um, positively, uh, you know, surprised by the remarks from uh, His Excellency Abdullah, the DG for 
FCSA uh, when he said his uh, positively jealousy um, for Rwanda <laughs> and, and he wants to uh, visit Rwanda with uh, his whole team. And uh, you can imagine in my position as ambassador of Rwanda and UAE, um, I'll, make it, I'll make it a point that he does so. So um, why, why has this been very important to us? Um, for some of you who will know the history of Rwanda, um, just 25 years ago, we went through a very, very dark history, um, which was characterized by the genocide against the Tutsis. So anyone would wonder whether you know, doing business reforms would have been a priority at all you know, for a country like Rwanda. But Earlier on, uh, in 2000, we started working on our Vision 2020. Um, and pillar number three of our Vision 2020 was actually uh, private sector development. So we knew that the role of government was really to facilitate uh, business uh, as a enabler. We, we knew very early on that uh, we had a job to do in creating an enabling environment. And what better way than to actually uh, embark on an ambitious reform agenda? So fast forward, um, we started our reform agenda in 2008. So it's more than a decade now uh, of reform. Uh, we started at position 150, uh, going by the World Bank, you know, doing business ranking. And in just two years, we broke the record. We moved 76 positions up because of the top leadership commitment and ownership of the entire process. And in 10 years, we, we are now ranked among the uh, top 40 uh, globally and the only low-income country um, in that category. So it's been a way, in a way, it's been a rewarding journey. Uh, and we think it's good business, it's uh, smart politics. And if I can share just some of the uh, results, although causation might be a bit uh, tough there, we've seen uh, FDI inflows uh, in our country grow above the regional average uh, when we compare ourselves to the region and looking at FDI um, compared to GDP um, for these countries. We've seen employment offered by uh, foreign investors grow fourfold. It grew fourfold since 2008 when we started the reforms. So as a government, our role has been to try and see if you don't have really uh, the natural resources, if you are a landlocked country like us, how do you create sufficient pool factors? How do you create enough Sorry, traction? Okay. How do you make sure that you make yourself that attractive? How do you make sure that actually the story that is being talked about is not about your dark history, but the positive uh, developments, the reforms that you're doing? So it was really uh, one of those policy choices that we had to take, uh, not only to create the pool factors that we needed for investment for uh, jobs, but to make sure that as a country, we were on the right path to development and the social transformation that we want for our people. Thank you very much. I think it's an inspirational story for, for many in this room. Um, I'll turn to, uh, to Minister Humalo with the same question, and then I'll, I'll introduce our third speaker who has joined us after that. But the question that we're discussing is why doing business? Why, why is it important for, for each of these three uh, different countries in Africa? So, Minister Humala, over to you. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much, uh, Lisa, and uh, distinguished uh, delegates. I, I think the question of why, um, uh, you know, uh, doing business becomes imperative for uh, a country like Eswatini is, is a very... Um, people to our question to our destination as a country. Um, we, we are a country that uh, has a small population of 1.2 million people. 
um, and uh, we have positioned ourselves in our new strategic roadmap 2019 to 2022 um, as a country that wants to be an export uh, driven economy. Um, we are also positioning ourselves to be a country that will be uh, a private sector led economy, uh, meaning that uh, we really need to ensure that uh, our entire um, business environment uh, is conducive to, uh, to bring investors into the country um, and uh, also uh, promote local uh, indigenous um, uh, SMEs to grow uh, with an export-oriented um, mentality, particularly in, in the advent of the AFCFTA. We've identified five key sectors to drive our economy in the area of mining and energy, um, in the area of agriculture, in the area of agro-processing and manufacturing, uh, in the area of tourism, as well as the area of ICT and ICT education. Uh, but we do understand deeply that uh, the ease of doing business is the key enabler to ensuring that um, we really realize our dream, uh, because it is very clear in our minds that if uh, we don't do uh, well in the ease of doing business. Um, it is an economy that, by definition, is not going to grow unless it is export-oriented, uh, which then means that um, we need to change uh, you know, our fortunes by uh, making it easy for businesses to, um, the op to operate in a Swatini. We are acutely aware of where we need to improve. Um, uh, we have uh, leadership commitment uh, from the very top uh, when His Majesty the King was making his, uh, you know, beginning of uh, fiscal year uh, speech in Parliament. He said the ease of doing business is our paramount um, objective as a cabinet. And uh, you see that by, you know, our presence here. I'm here with uh, my colleague from Eswatini, the Minister of Justice and uh, we, uh, we have a full mandate from His Excellency the Prime Minister to ensure uh, that we glean the best practices, uh, we connect with the leaders um, that we see across the different elements, and we really uh, fast track our improvement. Uh, we have a very aggressive um, uh, target uh, in terms of how we want to improve uh, because we, we realize that for us to be um, best in class we need to learn from the best. So, um, looking at all the, the, the different uh, elements within the ease of doing business, we are very comfortable that, um, you know, uh, pursuing excellence in each one of them is really what is going to make Eswatini uh, the, the next big story in Africa uh, after Rwanda. Great, thank you very much. And it's my pleasure to, to introduce uh, Mr. Alma Umaro, who is the President's Advisor on Investment Climate uh, for the Republic of Niger. Uh, thank you for joining us, and, and apologies, we couldn't find you uh, before the, the panel. Uh, but we, we started just recently, and the, the first question we are discussing is, although we have three um, rather uh, different countries, um, all three of you have, have chosen to prioritize doing business as a, as a topic as a, in the policy agenda of your countries. So the question is why? why? Why is it important to the Republic of Niger to, to push uh, on these reforms? Merci, Madame. Je voudrais d'abord vous présenter mes excuses parce que je crois qu'il y a eu un problème de compréhension. Et je, on me disait que c'était après le petit déjeuner de la science. Mais on m'a rattrapé, donc euh, il n'est jamais tard pour bien agir. Et pour ce qui est des réformes, comme vous l'avez dit, et mes prédécesseurs certainement ont dû dire les objectifs communs que poursuivent les pays africains en se lançant dans les réformes de leur économie. Les, les populations, au tout début, quand on faisait les réformes, pensaient que c'était une contrainte de la Banque mondiale. Il s'agissait d'une conditionnalité de l'aide de la Banque mondiale. Nous leur avons fait comprendre bien au contraire. Les réformes, nous les faisons nous-mêmes, non pas pour la Banque mondiale, mais pour nos populations. Dans un pays comme le Niger, et très rapidement, le Niger, c'est un pays très vaste, 1 267 000 km2. Et les deux tiers, c'est désertique, et on n'a pas accès à la mer, donc c'est un pays enclavé. 
En ce moment, que faut-il faire pour le pays Il faut que nous boostions l'économie, que nous la boostions en créant des champions nationaux. Il faudrait que les Nigériens puissent se lancer dans des affaires. Nous avons un secteur informel au Niger qui fait les deux tiers de l'économie. Nous nous sommes lancés dans les réformes déjà en essayant de mettre tout ce secteur informel dans le formel, en facilitant justement la création des entreprises. Et le Niger, dans ce domaine, a été à un moment donné le premier en Afrique. Mais comme les autres avancent, on a dû un peu régresser, mais nous occupons toujours de quoi nous sommes. La 27e place dans les réformes et nous avons un score de plus de 91 points. Donc nous avons voulu le faire justement pour que tout ce secteur informel vienne dans le secteur formel en facilitant la création, en levant les obstacles. Mais les réformes également ont un effet direct sur la gouvernance. Parce que de plus en plus, nous voulons qu'il n'y ait pas de contact entre l'administration et le, la population, que nous puissions dématérialiser l'ensemble de nos procédures. Le faisant, ça veut dire que vous êtes en train de faire disparaître certains faux frais. Euh, comme vous le savez, quand euh, souvent c'est la personne, l'agent qui s'agit de faire euh, des autorisations, là où il faut une heure, on va mettre deux heures. Là où il faut deux jours, on va mettre trente jours. Donc de plus en plus, nous faisons toutes ces, ces formalités, que ce soit les impôts, la douane, nous les faisons en ligne. Donc cet effet de formaliser l'économie, c'est un autre aspect. Le deuxième aspect, c'est bien sûr d'attirer l'investissement étranger. L'étranger ne vient chez vous que quand il est sûr d'avoir de la sécurité. La sécurité, certes physique, nous l'avons également. Nous sommes dans une zone en conflit avec euh, l'Est euh, Tchad Nigeria et au nord le Mali. Mais le Niger est malgré tout assez bien sécurisé. Mais la sécurité que cherche l'investisseur, c'est aussi la sécurité juridique. Que je sois sûr qu'en investissant, du jour au lendemain, les règles ne vont pas changer. Donc voilà pourquoi nous sommes lancés dans ces réformes, pour que nous fortifions l'écosystème de l'économie, pour que l'ensemble des acteurs qui interviennent dans tous les indicateurs que je vais pas citer, puisqu'on les connaît tous, que nous puissions faciliter leur accès aux investisseurs étrangers qui viennent. Nous nous sommes rendus compte de plus en plus que l'aide internationale fait du bien, mais peut-être qu'il faut avoir des contacts directs avec le secteur privé. Et à ce titre, le Niger a été champion à l'occasion du sommet extraordinaire de l'Union africaine. Nous avons eu des accords avec beaucoup de partenaires dans les PPP, partenariats publics privés, ou dans les BOT. Donc les gens ont eu confiance en notre pays pour pouvoir investir. Ils ne l'auraient pas fait si on n'avait pas assaini l'économie, si on n'avait pas assaini le climat des affaires. Et autres secteurs, maintenant, au-delà, au niveau interne, c'est promouvoir l'entrepreneuriat des jeunes et des femmes. Voilà les cibles que nous avons poursuivies et que nous poursuivons en faisant les réformes. Ce n'est pas encore traduit. <rire> Merci. <rire> yeah. Merci. Okay. Thank you very much. So, um, as I mentioned before, we, we started with the why, and I think that um, comes across pretty clearly from, from all three countries, and I suspect for many countries in the region, which is that there's a huge, um, partially, that there's a huge jobs imperative in Africa. We've heard many speakers talk about the need to create jobs, the need uh, to have more jobs also in the, form in the formal sector, when you have many, many uh, entrepreneurs in the informal sector. Interestingly, all three countries also are, are landlocked, um, so all of them have mentioned exports and the importance of trade. And then the, the, the twin to trade, of course, is always foreign investment. So that, that appears to be uh, shared priorities among all three. Um, so that's a bit the why, but I'm interested now to deep dive a little bit deeper in the how uh, each of you reformed, because you each have your, your own success stories. Um, one thing I heard um, particularly from the first two speakers was it was about having a vision of where you're going. I think that's something that um, Jamila alluded to also uh, in the earlier panel. She had that slide with the sort of keys to, to reform, which um, in addition to vision included leadership at a high level, uh, constant monitoring and evaluation, very clear action plans, um, engagement with the private sector and so forth. 
So maybe we could hear just a couple minutes from each of the panelists on, in your view, from, from what you saw, what were two or three of the key success uh, factors that, that contributed to the reform? And then just so you start thinking, we'll move after that to the opposite side, what were a couple challenges? So save those. Please, but let's start with uh, what, what were the success factors. Thank you. Well, thank you very much again, Lisa. I guess one has to um, also put this into context. Um, when you ask a business person, when you ask an investor, what is it that will really attract him or her? What will it be that really moves uh, a CEO to expand his business to your country, probably uh, doing business reforms is not going to be top on the list. The, the thing is, you know, you cannot just do doing business reforms in isolation. It has to be a holistic national agenda for transformation. It has to be uh, embedded in the whole process of making sure that you are attractive as a destination. So your macroeconomic stability, your safety and security, uh, your investment in infrastructure, your investment in skills development, all make it possible for investors to come. And of course, the enabling environment is probably uh, the, the cornerstone that really makes the decision. So how does this succeed? And in our case, uh, maybe I can just say three things. Number one, from earlier on, as I said before, there was a clear vision that the business of government is not to do business, but to facilitate business to do business. And we did that, meaning, uh, the vision was there and very clear, but vision is not enough. You need implementation. For implementation to happen, in our case we saw, uh, there is a bit of more top-down approach than bottom-up. Meaning you have to have a demanding client, you must have a demanding leader who does not settle for less. So you can imagine, uh, when we embarked on this journey at position 150, I mean, our, our vision was to be in the top 30 by 2020. Uh, by 2019, Rwanda was ranked number 28th, 20, 29th. So we had actually reached the target, but you can't be complacent because a year later, you know, we found ourselves uh, sliding back a little bit because of one indicator. So top leadership commitment, that vision that is clear and easily communicated is critical. Number two, institutions. How do you make sure that you have institutions that are delivering to this vision? So building the capacity of our people to understand the uh, importance of these reforms, empowering them to do the right decisions at the right time, very critical. Also, engaging all the stakeholders, especially the private sector. If you do reforms, who are you doing them for? So getting feedback and continuously improving to respond to what they are looking for is critical. But last and uh, not least, uh, communication. When you do reforms and you don't communicate, the respondents would give a different story because they don't know what has happened or they've not experienced it you know, in that time when the assessment is happening. So ensuring that your reforms are widely communicated, the beneficiaries test them and actually have an experience to share with whoever is asking is very important. So, for us, uh, making sure that uh, we have uh, clarity of vision and purpose, uh, the top leadership commitment, 
making sure that we have institutions that work. We had to create a steering committee uh, that was uh, composed of uh, representatives from different agencies that are concerned with these reforms and having a clear action plan. And it's, it's an ending, you know, uh, reforms are uh, an ending process. You don't just have one plan today and you think that will work for the next year. It's always changing. It's very dynamic. The needs of the private sector are changing. And you keep, you know, in updating your action plan, uh, adding in a few things, leaving what doesn't work, adopting what works. And that is really a continuous process of engagement and collaboration across the whole of government. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister Humalo, maybe to, to hear your perspective from Iswatini, what have been some of the success factors? What, what has served you well uh, in, in pushing for reforms for, uh, related to doing business? Uh, thank you again, Lisa. Um, I think our story so far has been a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, we've had a few successes and we've also had a few challenges. So maybe at the back end of this, when you talk about challenges, I would address the challenges. Okay. Um, we've seen lots of, um, you know, good uh, improvement, uh, particularly in areas such as trading across borders. Currently, Eswatini is the first in Africa when it comes to trading across uh, borders. We are ranked 35th in the world, uh, but uh, in Africa we, we are one of the very best. And I think uh, what we've done in that particular area should serve as a template of how we should be improving the rest of, um, you know, the indicators um, across uh, the board. Um, we, we've also seen some improvement in uh, starting a business. Um, we're not too happy with the rate of improvement. We think we, we should be leapfrogging some of the, 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 the challenges based on our technological um, advancement, uh, and we believe um, we should be able to, to see significant improvements because a lot of work is happening behind the scenes uh, on that. Uh, but we improved uh, three places in this uh, recent uh, ranking. Uh, when it comes to uh, registering property, we've also improved uh, three places uh, in this uh, recent uh, you know, ranking. And again, it's, it's, it's a good uh, story. Uh, when it comes to um, uh, dealing with uh, uh, contractors. Uh, we've improved 11 places, um, uh, as well as um, one more indicator when it comes to getting electricity. We've improved 31 places uh, in this last ranking. How have we done that? Um, uh, number one, it is leadership commitment, making sure that, um, you know, from the very top of leadership, uh, I mentioned His Majesty's commitment earlier on, the Prime Minister's commitment. Uh, cabinet's uh, commitment, uh, but that has to filter down to all the uh, key elements and tenets of government, and we are beginning to see that. Uh, we are beginning to see cross-functional teams uh, that are really stepping up. Uh, we are beginning to see the alignment of budget priorities to the ease of doing business, because we have said the ease of doing business is one of our key enablers uh, in us, at, uh, you know, achieving our strategic uh, imperative as, uh, as, a, as a country. Um, number two, it is really best practice, um, you know, sharing and learning. We are starting to associate ourselves with each of the key leaders um, in each of the indicators. Uh, so, for example, we are forging a strong relationship right now with New Zealand uh, on starting a business, and we are at a point where you know, they'll be coming through early in the year to do a diagnostic with a view of forging a long-term partnership so that in the next three to four years, uh, Eswatini becomes one of the key, uh, you know, countries when it comes to starting a business. And we realize that, um, you know, th there's no uh, point in making the same mistakes that other people have made, uh, but there's so much value in learning from uh, where others have actually succeeded. So. Um, uh, managing those relationships is, is extremely key for us and identifying those uh, strategic partners that will help us uh, to, to really fast track uh, our improvement uh, is, is extremely key. Uh, the, the third thing then is, is, is really stakeholder management within the country and particularly the private sector. 
Um, we believe that our solutions must not be government-led, but private sector-led. What that means is that we need to design all our processes from the voice of our customer. In our case, the customer is your SMEs, uh, your cooperatives, your micro and, and medium enterprises, uh, your big business, your foreign direct investors, uh, and they should be the ones telling us how they want uh, processes within the country to be structured. And we believe a, a strong stakeholder management um, uh, program is what's going to um, uh, you know, uh, move the needle for uh, Swatini in the next uh, three to five years. Uh, I mean, the representation we have here in this particular forum speaks for itself. Uh, we, we even have, uh, you know, our judicial uh, leaders uh, amongst uh, the attendees here that speaks to how well we are managing our stakeholders. So I think, you know, looking at some of our success stories that I've mentioned and uh, focusing on the leadership commitment, uh, learning from the best and having a very strong engagement program with our key stakeholders with a focus on the private sector uh, is, uh, you know, some of the approaches we're using. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And um, turning now to Monsieur Umaru, um, I would be interested to hear in the case of Niger, uh, whether some of these success factors resonate for you, would, do you have a similar experience or anything else that you would share? In, in particular, and, and unfortunately I don't, I don't know that part of Africa very well yet, but an interesting story for me as someone looking at business environment is you have a unique, I think, regional entity as well in, in the form of OHADA, which has played some role in reforms, um, I believe. So I'd, I'd be interested to hear also about that experience, whether that has, has contributed to your success. Ohada. <laughs> semi-présidentiel, un président de la République qui nomme un Premier ministre. Quand vous venez, vous êtes dans un programme de réforme important, il faudrait que le Président et le Premier ministre soient en phase avec l'équipe en charge des réformes. Nous avons cette chance extraordinaire au Niger que le Président de la République en personne est engagé pour mener ces réformes. Il l'a prouvé au Niger mais aussi au niveau africain, parce que je crois qu'il est bon de le rappeler, le président de la République du Niger a été chargé de la mise en œuvre de la zone de libre-échange économique continentale. Il a eu un an pour le faire et il a fait dans le délai d'un an. Et la zone de libre-échange économique continentale a été ratifiée à Niamey le 7 juillet 2019. C'était une prouesse et c'est un des tout premiers traités dans l'histoire de l'Union africaine qui ait été ratifiée dans ces délais, qui est mis en action. Donc nous avons ce leadership au niveau du chef de l'État, au niveau du Premier ministre, mais aussi avoir une équipe en charge du Green Business, des réformes, une équipe compétente, disponible et qui est en mesure d'apporter toujours sa contribution, d'aller vers l'avant, de répondre aux défis. Si ces trois facteurs sont réunis, je crois que on a facilement la chance également d'avoir l'accompagnement de partenaires. Dans tout ce que nous avons fait, nous avons été beaucoup accompagnés par nos partenaires au développement et plus particulièrement par la Banque mondiale. Je vois notre ami Ranké de la Banque mondiale, de la SFI, et l'équipe de la Banque mondiale du Niger et ailleurs, y compris au niveau africain, a été toujours à nos côtés. Mais aussi pour faire les réformes, on ne va pas la roue. Beaucoup d'Africains ont eu du succès. Mon frère du Rwanda, nous avons eu l'honneur d'établir des contacts avec le Rwanda, d'aller visiter MDB, et c'est de Maurice que je suis venu directement ici, à Dubaï, en vue de nous familiariser aux pratiques d'Ile Maurice. Donc tous ces facteurs, quand ils sont réunis, je crois que les réformes sont possibles. Parce que quand il y a le leadership, alors il faut chercher l'adhésion des partis, l'implication de toutes les parties. 
notamment du secteur privé. Et dans le système nigérien, le président de la République a fait du dialogue entre le secteur privé et le secteur public une priorité. À l'époque, l'interface entre le secteur privé et le gouvernement, c'était le ministère du Commerce. Le président de la République l'a placé au niveau du Premier ministre. Et aujourd'hui, il l'a placé à son niveau, au niveau du cabinet du président de la République. Donc c'est dire que les problèmes sont pris à la source. Ça veut dire que leur solution également se trouve au niveau du président de la République, au niveau du Premier ministre et de l'ensemble du gouvernement, parce qu'il y a une équipe de, qui se réunit à intervalles réguliers pour poser des problèmes et pour leur trouver des solutions. Donc, une réforme, c'est une œuvre de longue haleine. Dans beaucoup de secteurs, vous avez dit que vous ne connaissez pas le Niger, le Niger est membre de de l'OADA, c'est l'organisation du droit harmonisé donc, euh, en Afrique. Nous sommes membres d'une communauté qu'on appelle ECOWAS en anglais, la CEDEAO, qui regroupe donc 15 États. Et nous sommes aussi membres d'une communauté sous-régionale, lui au moins, qui est une des zones les plus intégrées de l'Afrique. Et dans ce domaine, le Niger fait partie du peloton des têtes en matière de réforme, aussi bien à l'OADA euh, qu'à lui au moins que dans la CEDEAO. Nous sommes entre 4 et 5e et sixième dans euh, un ensemble de 17 pays. Donc c'est dire que nous avons fait d'importantes réformes. Et aujourd'hui, le challenge pour nous, c'est de faire en sorte que le Niger, qui a été le moteur de la mise en place de la zone de libre-échange économique, que nous ne puissions pas être en retrait. Donc les réformes doivent nous pousser à nous industrialiser, à avoir tout ce qui nous manque en matière d'électricité. Nous sommes sur un grand projet de barrage. Parce que si vous voulez avoir des problèmes dans le raccordement à l'électricité, il faudrait que vous ayez, ayez d'abord l'électricité en quantité et en qualité. Donc, c'est ce qui nous permet de combler beaucoup de retards dans beaucoup de secteurs où nous sommes engagés dans les réformes. Donc, voilà l'objectif des réformes, leadership, cohésion et communication. Thank you very much. Um, so as we have just a few minutes left, so I think we'll give each panelist a chance for uh, last couple words. What, what I would ask is, uh, coming back to what I promised before, what do you see as a key challenge? So I think we heard sort of six, uh, six uh, features that um, have supported all of you. Um, vision, um, a um, strong leader uh, supported by strong teams, solid institutions, um, strong uh, communications, uh, use of best practice, and strong interaction with the private sector. I think those were kind of unifying. But what would you see as a, a key challenge? And perhaps together with that, uh, just to wrap things up a bit, you may want to say, uh, if you want to share anything about priorities for the, the coming year, so to, to have a, a bit of a forward look and not to end on a very pessimistic note. Uh, so let's, let's uh, continue to, to follow the same order, uh, starting with Rwanda. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Ch challenges are always, um, you know, inevitable whenever you are in this uh, cycle. But let me, let me say three challenges that we've seen um, in the whole process. Number one is uh, there's a bit of resistance to change uh, whenever, you know, there's a reform agenda and uh, reformers are uh, used to uh, a certain way of doing things. The beneficiaries are used to a certain way of doing things. How do you make sure that people change in time? And we, we've seen this, um, for example, in our case. I remember way back when we were creating a one-stop center to provide a one-stop shop uh, for businesses. And we had to merge eight institutions in one. So you can imagine having uh, eight CEOs coming under one roof to create one unified institution. Uh, you can imagine the level of resistance because there has to be one leader, not the eight that uh, you merged. And, and uh, another example was uh, when we were doing automation. Um, for example, moving to online registration of companies. And we had to probably handhold, you know, beneficiaries in the first few weeks by putting in place 
uh, an online registration help desk because they were not used to the whole uh, automation and online processes. Second, uh, which we've seen as a challenge, is really alignment on the urgency that comes with these reforms. If you want to achieve a reform in one year, so that you can begin enjoying the benefits in the second year, you have to have a sense of urgency. And if you're going to bring on board all the stakeholders, for example, legal reforms. Legal reforms take a lot of time. You know, from the time you're drafting the laws, amending laws, to the time they're approved by, by cabinet to parliament and from regression and all that, it takes quite a lot of time. So how do you align people that level of urgency that is required. And that has been a challenge working with, with all these stakeholders. And lastly, but not least, is sustaining the momentum of reform. Sustaining the reform momentum is a big challenge. We've seen a few countries in our region that used to be in the top, you know, uh, 30s. But because they went back and Relaxed, they have now dropped way, way back. So how do you ensure that you sustain the fire among all the reform institutions, fully aligned? Because all countries are reforming, and if, you, if you're not uh, really keeping uh, the momentum, you lose. So those have been uh, a number of challenges, but again, we know that the reforms are an ending journey, and if you really want to, to, to get results, uh, you have to be demanding. As a leader, as I said, it's a bit of more top-down than bottom-up, and you have to keep demanding for results and not settle for less. Thank you. Uh, Minister Humalo, from your perspective, uh, what have been some of the key challenges and any um, objective you've set for yourself uh, for the... Not you, maybe personally, well, maybe you personally <laughs> too, but he, that Iswatini yeah. may have said uh, in doing business. I think you, you mentioned before you feel like the progress lately has been, had, had slowed a bit, so maybe you have some thoughts about how to, to accelerate things again. Um, absolutely. I, I think we are clear minded that um, in the next five years we want Eswatini to be in the top 50 in the ease of doing business uh, globally. And that's a, a, a clear goal that we've set for ourselves, understanding the magnitude of the challenge that um, uh, we, we are accepting in, in articulating that goal. Um, some of the key challenges that have really made this um, journey uh, interesting, to say the least, are number one, the pace of change. Um, I, I think um, it has been very much government-led uh, up until now, and uh, if we can transition uh, to a point where it is private sector led with government providing the enabling environment, I believe strongly that uh, the pace of change will be uh, you know, um, in concert with where we want to get to. Right now, there's a very big disconnect with the pace at which we do things versus our aspirations. So, so that, that's a big, uh, I would say, um, frustration for everybody at the moment. Uh, when we need to get reforms through our, uh, you know, legislative process, uh, it takes forever. When we need to just implement uh, simple uh, reforms that have already been passed, um, it takes forever, so we need to fix that. Um, secondly, um, uh, resources. Uh, I think uh, being a developing country, we frequently have to prioritize uh, where we spend money and uh, it, it is a bit of a vicious cycle because if you don't forward invest in the ease of doing business, uh, then you are not going to get a private sector-led economy, you're not going to get investments coming through. Um, so we are right now as a cabinet team in the process of aligning uh, our budget priorities and our resource allocation to where we want to go. Uh, we are seriously asking ourselves uh, these questions to say if we have this destination are our budgets uh, reflecting uh, exactly where we want to go um, and uh, I believe strongly with the leadership from the Prime Minister uh, you know leading the charge from the front um, under his majesty's direction we, we will definitely get that right 
uh, we are beginning to get that right. Um, the third um, challenge that we need to overcome and overcome um, uh, quickly is change management. I think um, uh, uh, my colleague here has just spoken to that. Uh, when you're introducing something new, um, uh, you know, it's assimilation into the system, it's acceptance, um, even the burning platform, why do we need to change, uh, becomes a, a big uh, issue. So even in cases where uh, we've gone through reforms and we have, uh, you know, started implementation, implementing those reforms, just the acceptance of something different, uh, so the acceptance of something new uh, may not be as uh, seamless as we would love. And uh, it speaks to communication, 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 mm -hmm. explaining to people the why and what's in it for them uh, and what the country stands to benefit once it's implemented. And I think it's an area we need to get better at uh, as well as leaders to be able to articulate convincingly for all stakeholders why this is a good thing and how it's going to improve their lives. So we, we are quite um, um, aggressive, we're quite optimistic. Uh, we believe we've got uh, excellent support from the IFC in particular. Uh, the, the level of engagements uh, are, are really leading us to all the right connections and uh, we're truly grateful for uh, you know, the stewardship we're getting uh, from the World Bank and the IFC and uh, we, we will be here in five years and uh, we will be in the top 50. Great. I wish you success. We have one more uh, word while we're clapping for the top 50. <laughs> uh, last but certainly not least, Monsieur Rumaru, I wonder uh, from the perspective of the Republic of Niger, what would you say have been um, the biggest challenges in, in making progress on the doing business reforms and whether you have a specific uh, objective or goal uh, for the, the near future uh, to, to further progress? Monsieur, Madame, vous savez, le Niger, donc nous sommes venus de loin. En 2014, le Niger était 176e dans le classement de la Banque mondiale. Au dernier classement, nous sommes 132e. Donc, c'est dire que nous avons gagné 44 points dans cet espace-là. Et cette année 2020, le Niger a fait un saut de 11 places. Donc, la volonté y est et les objectifs qui ont eu était clairement défini et arrêté par le chef de l'État, ce que nous soyons, donc on va être beaucoup à la place, parce que nous aussi on va être dans le top 50. Donc je comprends <rire> mon ami qui va être là-bas, mais je crois qu'on va être ex -aequo. Donc c'est ce qu'on nous a demandé, il faut que nous soyons dans le top 50 et dans le top 5 en Afrique. Top 50 au niveau mondial, top 5 en Afrique. Actuellement, nous sommes à la 22e place en Afrique. Notre objectif, c'est d'aller à la cinquième place et au niveau mondial être à la cinquantième place mais dans les deux années à venir, ce n'est pas dans cinq ans nous. le président le demande pour 2021 son mandat finit en 2021 et il mérite que dans ces deux années que nous puissions faire ce saut de 80 et quelques points à peu près parce qu'on est 132 e on s'est engagé, l'équipe qui est là avec moi, je vous l'avais dit elle est motivée, déterminée et surtout assez très très compétente pour le faire, nous allons le faire et je sais que l'accompagnement des partenaires ne fera pas défaut. Mais il faut des conditions, vous l'avez dit, il faut l'engagement politique, il faut la volonté, le leadership, mais il faudrait l'adhésion de la population. Et pour qu'il y ait adhésion, nous avons beaucoup d'obstacles. Un des premiers obstacles, lancer des lois, des décrets ne pose pas de problème. Mais il faut que nous passions à échelle tout ce que nous avons fait, mais il faut la digitalisation. On est un pays vaste, 1 million 267 000 km carrés, 20 millions d'habitants, et où l'alphabétisation ne dépasse pas plus de 50% de la population. Donc il faut pousser l'éducation. C'est un facteur important dans les réformes. Il faut aussi amener le secteur informel, je vous l'avais dit, le faire passer au secteur formel. Donc la Chambre de commerce a un grand rôle à jouer avec le gouvernement. Si tous ces facteurs se réunissent, et si nous mettons les moyens pour promouvoir le commerce des jeunes et des femmes, qui sont les secteurs d'avenir, qui sont les facteurs de développement, je crois qu'avec l'accompagnement de nos partenaires, nous pouvons aller au devant de tous les défis et nous allons répondre à celui qui a été posé par le chef de l'État, que l'Iger soit top 50 mondial en 2021 et top 5 
en 2021 au niveau de l'Afrique. Voilà les grands défis, les obstacles. Ensemble, quand on se réunit, on peut déplacer des montagnes. Wonderful. So I would like to thank our panelists for traveling all this way and sharing their experience because the, the one success factor that I didn't mention before was learning from each other. And I think you, you all three of you have made a, a great contribution today. Um, and we, we look to the different countries, the different experiences, but we see some common denominators in how, how they approach it. Um, and I'm personally very inspired also by the drive that I, I hear from all three of you to, to continue that way. And so as the World Bank Group, we, we stand ready to support you however we can. So maybe just a final round of applause for our panelists and then we'll move to lunch. Merci beaucoup.